Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to be discussing the autonomic nervous system. And if you haven't watched the divisions of the nervous system video, you might want to go ahead and watch that before we start here, or at least have a quick review of the different divisions. Remember from our divisions of the nervous system lecture that the motor division is divided into somatic and autonomic divisions. The somatic motor division is comprised of skeletal muscles, which are the voluntary effectors that respond to input from the somatosensory division. These receptors tell the body what is going on with the outside world. For example, what you are hearing, or seeing, or feeling. The autonomic motor division deals with the body's interaction with the inside world, what is going on in the body. These responses, in contrast to skeletal muscle, are mostly involuntary. The effectors in the autonomic motor division are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. These effectors respond mostly to interoceptors, receptors that monitor conditions in the body. Much of this information picked up by interoceptors is unconscious, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and chemical levels. But some of it can be conscious perception, such as pain from cell damage. Within the autonomic nervous system are two divisions, sympathetic and parasympathetic. These mostly use the same effectors, which we call dual innervation. However, the two divisions are antagonistic. What this means is that while both divisions might have effects on heart rate, one division will have an excitatory effect and speed up the heart rate, and the other division may have an inhibitory effect and slow down heart rate. They do this by using different neurotransmitters which allows the target organ to respond differently to stimulation by one or the other division. The sympathetic nervous system is used in emergency responses. It is known as the fight or flight response. In times of emergency, it produces peak performance by maintaining blood flow to skeletal muscles. You can think of the sympathetic nervous system as being involved with things that start with an E. It is activated during exercise, excitement, embarrassment, and emergency. During these situations, it responds by increasing the heart rate, the ventilation rate, blood pressure, and some areas of smooth muscle contraction, such as in the blood vessels to the skin, digestive, and urinary organ. When you increase the smooth muscle contraction in these areas, it actually reduces the amount of blood that are going to the skin, digestive, and urinary organs. The sympathetic nervous system also increases liver function, encouraging glycogen breakdown and release of glucose into the bloodstream. However, not every system is increased by the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system also decreases smooth muscle contraction in other areas, such as in the airways. Decreasing contraction of the airways actually ends up opening the airways, allowing the maximum amount of oxygen to get into the lungs. The sympathetic nervous system also decreases renal function and glandular secretion. It is important to note that some effectors in the body only have sympathetic innervation. The lack of innervation sympathetic nervous system results in a resting response. For example, in blood vessels, the loss of innervation by the sympathetic nervous system means that the blood vessel will relax and dilate. The parasympathetic division does not have to activate the muscles for vasodilation to happen. The other division is the parasympathetic nervous system, and this is used to return the body to normal, known as the rest and digest system. You can associate the parasympathetic nervous system with the beautiful acronym SLUD, salivary, lacrimal, urinary, digestive, and defecation. During this situation, it responds by increasing blood flow to the skin and the digestive system. It also increases the digestion and renal function, nutrient storage, and anabolism, or building, of macromolecules. The parasympathetic nervous system decreases heart rate, ventilation, blood pressure, and catabolism of nutrients. Sometimes you get a parasympathetic response because there is a lack of sympathetic stimulation. 
Some examples of effectors that only use sympathetic innervation are the sweat glands, the erector pili, the adrenal medulla, and most of your blood vessels. Some textbooks, yours included, will break out a third subdivision of the autonomic nervous system, and this is the enteric nervous system, or ENS. This is associated with digestive functions and is regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Remember that the autonomic nervous system neurons are those multipolar motor neurons that synapse in the lateral gray horn of the spinal cord. Also remember that the skeletal motor pathway only has one neuron between the spinal cord and the effector. In the autonomic nervous system, there are two neurons in the pathway from the spinal cord to the effector. The two neurons synapse in a ganglion. Recall that a ganglion is a collection of cell bodies in the CNS. We saw this on the sensory side in the dorsal root ganglion. In the autonomic nervous system, the neuron going from the spinal cord to the ganglia is called the preganglionic neuron. And the one coming from the ganglion to the effector is the postganglionic neuron. All preganglionic neurons release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine at the ganglion. The postganglionic neuron releases either acetylcholine or norepinephrine to stimulate the effector. Sympathetic neurons, shown here, will release norepinephrine. Parasympathetic neurons will release acetylcholine. One part of the autonomic nervous system doesn't follow this two-neuron rule. When the autonomic nervous system stimulates the adrenal medulla, chromaffin cells within the adrenal medulla release norepinephrine and epinephrine directly into the bloodstream, where they travel throughout the body and have far-reaching effects. You can see the differences in the four types of motor innervation here. Somatic motor neurons synapse in the anterior gray horn and contain a single neuron that innervates the effector, the skeletal muscle cell, by releasing acetylcholine, which causes muscle contraction. The sympathetic response includes two neurons that receive instructions in the lateral gray horn, and the preganglionic neuron releases acetylcholine in the ganglion. The postganglionic neuron releases norepinephrine at the effector. The parasympathetic response also includes two neurons that receive instructions in the lateral gray horn, but both the preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron release acetylcholine. The innervation of the adrenal medulla by the preganglionic neuron results in the release of norepinephrine and epinephrine into the bloodstream. We'll learn more about this response in the endocrine system. Those neurons that release acetylcholine are called cholinergic neurons. There are two types of receptors that will recognize acetylcholine and respond. Nicotinic receptors are inside the ganglia on postganglionic neurons. In this case, acetylcholine is excitatory. It will cause an action potential in the postganglionic neuron. Muscarinic receptors are on the effector cell. In some cases, acetylcholine will be excitatory to the effector, and in some cases, it's inhibitory. It does this by either depolarizing or hyperpolarizing the effector cell. Neurons that release norepinephrine are called adrenergic. Remember that it is only the postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic nervous system that release norepinephrine. Receptors on the target organ will bind to the norepinephrine. This is usually stimulatory. A clinical application is that we can block the binding of norepinephrine and help reduce the excitatory effect. For example, beta blockers lower heart rate because they block the binding of norepinephrine by heart muscle cells. The norepinephrine is not able to stimulate the heart to beat faster. Albuterol opens airways by blocking the binding of norepinephrine by smooth muscle cells in the respiratory passages, therefore inhibiting contraction of respiratory of smooth muscle. An exception to this rule 
is the neurons that innervate the skin, for example, sweat glands. These sympathetic neurons release acetylcholine, and the gland contains muscarinic receptors. When these receptors bind to acetylcholine, it causes the cell to begin sweat production. The sympathetic division is also called the thoracolumbar division because the sympathetic preganglionic neurons synapse in the lateral gray horn and then leave the spinal cord in the thoracic and lumbar regions. You can see here that all of those preganglionic neurons are exiting the CNS between T1 and L3. The preganglionic neurons are relatively short, so the ganglia is quite close to the spinal cord. The postganglionic neurons are longer and innervate the organs of the head, thoracic cavity, abdominal cavity, and skin. The sympathetic nervous system will dilate the pupils, decrease glandular production in the digestive and reproductive system, increase pulse respiratory rate, and induce renin release from the kidneys to conserve body water. It also increases sweat gland activity to dissipate body heat, but it decreases blood flow to the skin so that the skeletal muscles will receive extra blood instead. Remember that the sympathetic nervous system also synapses in the adrenal medulla to trigger the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. This helps to provide a generalized boost of activity throughout the system. The parasympathetic division is also called the cranial sacral division because the parasympathetic preganglionic neurons synapse in the lateral gray horn and leave the spinal cord via the cranial nerves and the sacral region. The preganglionic neurons are long and the ganglia are mostly located in the walls of the target organs. The postganglionic neurons are therefore really, really short. Motor information goes to the eyes on the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number three, goes to the face on cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve, and cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve. Most of the thoracic and abdominal organs are innervated by cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve. This carries about 80% of the load of the parasympathetic nervous system. Although the effectors in the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system are mostly the same, they respond differently due to the different neurotransmitters used by these two divisions. This is called dual innervation. Let's talk now about there needs to be a balance between the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions. Imagine the body is kind of like a ball and each division is a kid that wants to play with the ball. If you've just had dinner and you're laying down on the couch to watch TV, the parasympathetic division gets control of the body. It's going to respond to the needs of the body by down-regulating heart rate and blood pressure and up-regulating flow of blood to the, the digestive organs and the urinary system. However, if a bear suddenly got into your kitchen, the body would respond to this emergency situation by letting the sympathetic division take over. It would raise the heart rate, respiration rate, and blood pressure, and make sure you had enough blood flow to the skeletal muscles that you could run away from the bear. Many of the systems of the autonomic nervous system are run by the hypothalamus. Even though the hypothalamus is the boss of many of the homeostatic mechanisms, it can still be regulated and modulated by the cerebral cortex. That's it for today. See you in class.